I'd like to uh, call to order this meeting of the Fairfield Board of Education for Thursday, April 5th, 2018. Uh, present is Ms. Leeper, uh, Mrs. Gerber, myself, Philip Dwyer, Mrs. Jacobson, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Maxon Canelli, and Mr. Peterson. Uh, we do have two uh, people absent because we know of them. If I could have you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and if you would remain standing uh, for a little bit afterwards. One of our board members is absent, Ms. Uh, Tricia Pitko, because her father passed away two days ago. I wanted to take this moment to uh, offer her condolences and to ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, we start off with the best uh, part of this meeting, which is student reports. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. O'Brien, do you want to start, or? Mr. Orban is oh, not I'm here I'm sorry, today. Mr. Rivera. Yeah, sure, I'll oh, kick it off. I, I um, didn't see the seat on the other side of you. My apologies. It's quite all right. It's a compliment. He's a very successful man. Um, <laughs> so, SATs occurred on March 24th, uh, 21st. We are very grateful that we were able to, able to get that out of the way because I know a lot of neighboring towns will have to wait till the 24th to get their SATs done. And um, our ninth and 10th grade dance with over 400 attendees occurred about two Fridays ago, I believe. And um, the second annual conference of our Achievement Gap Task Force for Fairfield Board um, was held on uh, Thursday, March 29th at the Southern Connecticut State University, a special venue for this year's conference. And uh, several schools uh, in the area participated, Greenwich Bridgeport, Meriden Ridgefield, Fairfield University, and Southern Connecticut State University. Uh, we are very proud to get that moving. Uh, spring sports are up and running despite the weather, as I can tell you for a fact, I just came back from a track meet, and to say the least, at least it's nice to have some uh, wind under your wings while you're running. <laughs> um, Ted and Mr. Ebling will be arriving in the next hour, hopefully, uh, with a victory in our uh, Ludlow Ward lacrosse game. And on Monday, April 2nd, we had our solar carport ribbon cutting ceremony, attended by many local officials. And between our uh, carports and the panels, we are supplied with about two-thirds of our electric power. And finally, everybody is looking forward to a full April break, despite many of the snow days. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions for our representative from Wood? No? Okay. Thank you. Ludlow, who wants to go first? I will. So um, two weeks ago, the cheerleaders competed in Orlando, and they won the gr overall grand champion trophy, the high point trophy, and national championships in the varsity advanced division. So they are now ranked first in the grand national division. On last Wednesday, the AP literature classes from both Ward and Ludlow took a combined trip to the Museum of Modern Art, where they learned about postmodernism, which supplements the novels that have been read in class. And they were able to take a private museum tour before it was open to the public. Juniors recently took the NSGG science test to help prepare them for the new national standards. And today was the Red Cross Club Spring Blood Drive. There were over 30 donators, and I spoke with the class president, who, the club president, who was extremely happy with the turnout. Um, so on March 24th, the Gov students took a trip to D.C. for the March for Our Lives, um, which was a really cool experience, and a lot, and we all benefited from it. Um, we got to meet up with Representative Jim Himes, and it was really fun and really cool. Um, we also have a few college fairs coming up. There's the large um, college fair at Webster Bank Arena, um, and then at our own school, we're having a community college fair. Um, on April 20th, um, an NCC, Housatonic, and Gateway are coming in for presentations about applying, transferring, and the benefits of community college. Um, and also specific programs at the schools are coming in, and they're, it's going to be like a fair style in the library um, where they can tell the students about the specific 
programs, and there's also two other programs coming in for apprenticeships and employment after high school. And lastly, the GSA Club um, went to True Colors on March 16th, which is the largest LGBTQ conference in the country, and it's at UConn, and it's a really cool um, place to go, and you go to little workshops and you learn more, and it's really fun, and it's really cool to be able to go. Thank you very much. Any questions for our students from uh, Lud Ludlow? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is a presentation on the science curriculum, uh, and so uh, does the superintendent want to make any comments before uh, they come up? I'll just thank them in advance before they even start, because I know they've worked so hard on it, and um, thank you, and, and I was able to see several of the science teachers earlier tonight, um, but thank you for all of the work that's gone into this. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Cummings. I'm the Chief Academic Officer. Um, in May of 2016, Dr. Puglis and Sheila Farrar presented to the Board of Education the new Social Studies curriculum. In December 2017, the high school headmasters presented the academic expectations. Last month, you heard from both of our technology educations and our library media specialists who provided you curriculum updates in their particular areas. In each of those pre uh, presentations, you heard the same words, inquiry, real world, problem solving, and engagement. Tonight, Ms. Fagello and Mr. Wakeman, along with uh, some of our teachers, will present the next generation science standards uh, curriculum uh, as it impacts our Fairfield Public Schools. You will hear those same words this evening. While the importance of curriculum content persists, the application of, those, of, of that content across curricular areas is new exciting and challenging. There is a community of skills that unite our instruction and our student learning. I now turn the presentation over to our program directors and the teachers. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Board of Education for inviting us here tonight. Uh, we're very excited about this opportunity to bring forward the pre-K through uh, grade 12 science curriculum documents. My name is Walter Wakeman. I am the program director for uh, elementary science, mathematics, and enrichment. And I'm Patrice Fagella. I'm the director of K-12 STEAM and 6 through 12 science. In addition, we're also excited about presenting a f the framework for our grades three through five STEAM program. We've had over 100 teachers, administrators, and community members involved in this process of rewriting our program. We'd like to thank all of those who are here tonight to support this work and ask them to stand and be recognized. So here's an overview of our presentation for this evening. Uh, we'll take you through the journey that uh, we've been on uh, in creating these documents um, and how they uh, I will share with you uh, the, what we did to prepare and research uh, for these documents. We'll also talk a little bit about the next generation science standards uh, and how the uh, performance expectations um, are constructed. We'll also help make connections, as uh, Mr. Cumming referenced a moment ago, um, to the other content areas. Uh, then we will um, have a closer look at the science uh, and engineering uh, practices and what they actually mean in the classroom. And then we'll dive into the documents that you have before you. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about evaluation and next steps. In this quote, the late Stephen Hawking emphasize the importance of discovery in science as a way to broaden our knowledge. This is exactly what our new standards are asking of our students and teachers. The last revision of the program was in 2006-2007. It's hard to believe that was early on in my career here. 
Here you can see the evolution of science education from the 1990s until today. Though our current program is rigorous, aligning our new program to the next generation science standards will have many benefits for our students, including creating better thinkers and problem solvers. Students will also have the opportunity to transfer those skills that Mr. Cummings referred to across many disciplines, such as math, social studies, technology education, and more. We see many opportunities to work together with our library media specialists as well. So, as uh, Ms. Pagelli just mentioned, um, our curriculum documents were adopted in 2006 and 2007. These next generation science standards were adopted by the state of Connecticut in 2015. These, do these documents have provided us with a vertical alignment, um, a greater vertical alignment pre-K through grade 12. The new curricula, uh, along, uh, similar to the Common Core Mathematics and uh, Common Core Language Arts, um, were designed to help students um, with college and career readiness. Uh, they provide students with more opportunities and choice based on interests, potential career paths in high school, and there's more opportunity for cr uh, cross-content uh, convergence. Good evening. My name is Amy Lacey, and I'm a math science teacher at Stratfield Elementary. As you can see, our teachers have been working on curriculum development from the beginning of 2014 to the present. We convened writing committees of teachers led by our program directors who have also held parent focus groups to get feedback from the community. The documents were then revised this fall based on feedback from both parents and teachers. In Fairfield, we worked with groups of teachers to learn more about the shifts and expectations of the new standards before we began to write the curriculum documents. We had many professional opportunities for teachers at all three levels, elementary, middle, and high school, using in-house expertise, conferences and training sessions, and through the use of consultants. This included sending a number of teachers to NGSX training, which stands for Next Generation Science Exemplar-Based Professional Learning Systems. I have been very excited to learn more about the Next Generation Science Standards. At one of the many professional development opportunities I attended, it was inspiring to see teachers side by side investigating waves. Through open-ended exploration, we observed the effects of placing a tuning fork in water. The resulting phenomena sparked our curiosity and we were fascinated as the sound waves rippled through the water. Through our own questions, we began to explore how sound waves affected the movement of water. This relates to a number of scientific concepts, including energy transfer, as well as how sound waves travel through different mediums. In these slides, you can see elementary, middle, and high school teachers investigating the new science standards as if they were the students. This helps them to better understand how students will experience science as they sort or classify shells or explore the effects of force and motion on a ping pong ball. These new science standards place a greater emphasis on inquiry and phenomena while using active involvement to support and enhance concept development. Now let's get into how these new standards are different than the previous Connecticut science standards. The NGSS is not a set of daily standards, but a set of expectations for what students should be able to do by the end of instruction years or grade bands. So the performance expectations set the learning goals for students, but do not describe how students will get there. Grade bands are broken into K through two, three through five, middle school and high school. During the forum on the vision of a graduate that was held recently, many of our community members were calling for just these types of skills. The standards are of three types, and you can see the color codes um, up there. I'll refer to those uh, in several uh, upcoming slides. The science and engineering practices are in blue, and those are what students are doing. The disciplinary core ideas are in orange, and those are typical science content um, and domains. 
and the cross-cutting concepts are in green. Those are the big ideas that pervade all of science. The disciplinary core ideas may be most familiar as the domains of science, earth and space science, physical science, and life science. The Fairfield documents mirror the three dimensions of the next generation science standards. Also, the science practices you see here are very well aligned with the College Board's science practices. Obviously, science is a content-based subject. We still expect our students to have content knowledge, but we also expect them to apply that knowledge and synthesize information to create new solutions to problems. Next, we will show you one particular standard related to heredity and how it develops through a student's experience. You will you will see each component of the three dimensions which are color coded embedded in the standard. So I'm going to give you a moment. You have three documents in front of you. I'm going to ask you to please turn to page six of the grade three document, page eight of the grade seven document, and page seven of the biology document. And I'm going to point your attention to the box that is labeled performance expectations. Oh, okay. I thought maybe magic just happened or something. <laughs> <laughs> if you look up at the screen for just one moment, you'll see the color coding that I was referring to. And I'll, I'll talk about that. If you want to look at the documents, I'll point those out to you. Um, in this slide, you can see the interwoven nature of the performance expectations. The blue being, sorry, the, bl <laughs> the blue being the science and engineering practices, the green being the cross-cutting concepts, and the orange, although it doesn't look too orange here, being the disciplinary core ideas or the content as, as we would commonly refer to it. Um, each one of these standards um, teachers have to work with in order for their students to be able to perform this. Um, and it will be assessed on our new NGSS field test that one of our students, student reps referred to earlier. Um, so you can also see the progression of the standard over time. Um, if you look, uh, in grade three, students are being asked to analyze and interpret data, okay, or to provide evidence. In grade seven, which is that MS means middle school, they're being asked to use a model. That's a little higher expectation. Um, and then in high school, they're being asked to make and defend a claim. So although the topic is heredity in each area, as we rise through the grades, the expectation level and the complexity level of these standards increases. So now we're going to <clears throat> discuss a little bit about how uh, these practices that we were just referring to um, are uh, in integrated into the other disciplines. So when you look at uh, the skills and practices in each of these content areas, the Common Core uh, Mathematics, the Common Core English Language Arts, and the Next Generation Science Standards, you can see the integration or the intersection of these practices in all three areas. Uh, for example, in the gray area there, you'll see an example of uh, constructing a viable argument using evidence uh, to support their, and using evidence to support their claims. Um, we also feel very strongly that uh, asking questions and defining problems is another common uh, experience that all students will have in all these different content areas. Additionally, as referenced before, uh, the inquiry skills and social studies are found in the next generation science standards. So I just want to draw your attention to the center uh, white uh, circle there that says inquiry arc. You'll see um, that it references developing questions and planning inquiries, <coughs> gathering and uh, evaluating evidence, and communicating conclusions. And again, referencing the library media curriculum, 
that you had uh, just seen uh, recently. Um, these skills uh, are integrated in thro throughout all content areas. And so students are really immersed in the inquiry of, and information skills, the cre thinking critically and creatively, uh, communicating and collaborating, um, independent reading, obviously, and technology that's integrated uh, throughout. Again, these things are overlaps with the new uh, curricular documents that we're bringing forward tonight. So now we'd like to uh, take a closer look at the actual uh, standards themselves. Hello, I'm Amy Francoletti. I'm a teacher at Stratfield Elementary School. I teach second grade. This slide shows you some of the possible elementary phenomena. These are everyday events that we want students to be excited about, which can be as simple as the annual growth of flowers or plants, the effects of cold weather on a vehicle, or how the sun impacts a puddle through evaporation. Note that phenomena are both big or small event observable events. One example of phenomena that we use in second grade when studying properties of matter is when we combine salt and water in one container, sand and water in another. After stirring both mixtures, the contents are poured through a paper towel into another container. After viewing a phenomena, students are then discuss their observations and generate questions about the phenomena. We want our students to observe and question what is happening around them to stimulate learning. Like why, when I put a pencil on a desk, it stays there? Or why a ball rolls down a ramp? Science answers questions about phenomena. You can see two examples of phenomena here. We'll try them with you. The first one is a tanker car that was cleaned the night before this video was taken. Now that you've just watched the video, think about what you observed. And then think about what questions you now have. In a classroom, as students generate questions, the teacher is thinking about the science concepts that are embedded in the standards. The second clip we will show you is one of our Fairfield Ludlow teachers, Lisa Tanucci, demonstrating a phenomena for her students at the beginning of a unit of study. She is dropping ice cubes into beakers. Whoops. <laughs> Once again, think about what you observed and what questions do you now have based on those observations. After observing phenomena just like you did, the students would discuss their observations and then generate questions about what they saw. This becomes the driving force to their learning. Throughout this process, teachers are careful not to draw conclusions until evidence is established. So what's the difference between science and engineering? Scientists ask what happened and why in the natural world. They try to explain phenomena like the ones you just saw. Here you see some of our student scientists collecting samples and using digital microscopes to identify plankton they collected at the Mill River. Here are some additional examples of our student scientists investigating phenomena. In this case, middle school students on the right looking at pulley systems and explaining how the mass attached affects the system. The elementary students on the left are working at the Birdcraft Museum to gather information about habitats. And the pre-kindergarten student in the center is looking for fossils. <coughs> My name is Ryan Kelly. Um, I'm an AP biology teacher and human anatomy teacher at uh, Fairfield Ludlow High School. And I was just going to speak for a minute about the technology piece. Um, I was really lucky at the start of second semester uh, to be issued a class set of uh, Chromebooks. I got a set of 24 Chromebooks for my classroom. And as teachers, we're often hear that we need to teach our students 21st century skills. So things like creating, collaborating, asking questions, 
and of course using technology. And so I feel having the technology in my room has really made it a lot easier for me to accomplish that. We also as teachers often hear the phrase, um, you know, don't be a sage on the stage. In other words, don't just stand up there and lecture and deliver content. Be more of a guide on the side. And before I had the, the, the Chromebooks in my room, sometimes that was hard advice to follow because, you know, I was the sole source of expertise in the room. But now with the Chromebooks, I can much more feel like I am a guide on the side because they have full access to the Internet and all the resources and all the expertise that is out there. I also feel like I'm using significantly less resources. I'm using significantly less paper. Um, I'm spending significantly less time at the photocopier. Uh, the materials I am using are in full color. They can be animated. Um, they can be simulations. There's just a tremendous amount I can do with the technology. Um, I brought an example just for you to see. This is the example of the Chromebooks I have in my room. I think the size is great. Um, it doesn't take up their full desk. They can still have their notebook next to them. They can take notes um, and use the technology at the same time. Um, it's been very reliable. Uh, all the students are able to access the Wi-Fi in the room uh, consistently. The battery life has been very good. I only have to charge it, I find, like every three days. Um, so it's been a very nice, reliable machine for use in my classroom. So I guess in closing, I just really want to thank um, the Fairfield community, the Board of Education, uh, you know, for providing the, the funds and initiative to increase the amount of technology in our classrooms. I want to thank uh, my administrators, especially Greg Hatzis, Patrice Fagella, uh, the folks in the IT department I've been working with, Nancy Burns, uh, Karen King. And I'm really excited by um, the prospect of all the science classrooms uh, getting Chromebooks uh, next year. And um, I, th I feel like in the last couple of months, I'm only starting to scratch the surface of the tech. So thank you. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, engineering. So the engineers um, also ask questions. They use the answers uh, that scientists find to help create new innovations. They use ideas and apply them to solving human problems. Like scientists, engineers ask questions. Uh, however, they ask questions about uh, the problems and how to define the problems and then how to test solutions. So science and engineering really go hand in hand. We're very excited about this at the elementary level. This is going to be uh, a very new experience uh, for all of our elementary teachers as we integrate this. Uh, and again, as Ms. Vigella mentioned just a moment ago, the STEAM uh, component of that will help to support this initiative as well. So firstly, don't panic with all the words on the slide. Um, many of you are familiar with the laboratory experiences you had throughout your schooling. The next generation science standards require that students go beyond the traditional lab. Here you see a middle school heredity task. <laughs> While there's quite a bit of wording on this slide, it's up to the teacher to chunk this information for his or her students. And that would include students who might struggle with this. Um, some of our students with special needs, some of our English language learners, um, um, as well as our, um, our students, uh, our other students in the class. Um, we will point out the three dimensions um, uh, in this task and the increased level of rigor our new curricula will include. So could you fly for me? Thank you. As you can see, students are asked to apply the scientific information and skill they have acquired to explain a phenomena, in this case, antibiotic resistance. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce um, Jen Rassiopo, who actually, at the high school level, is also working on um, an NGSS unit on antibiotic resistance. My name is Jen Rassiopo. I teach science at Fairfield Ward. Um, forgive me for reading this. I didn't want to miss anything. So after 21 years of teaching science of all levels, I've jumped into NGSS head-on in my honors biology and elective courses. Although I still feel I have a lot to learn, I feel I can already see the benefits. I anticipated students being able to apply what they learn in new situations. I anticip anticipated them to be able to um, 
I expected them to be able to create and design solutions to challenging questions, questions that don't have solvable answers necessarily on the Internet. Problems they must solve in a new and novel way. Their assessments are multi-layered and more complicated than they've been in the past, yet their performance in varied grade le grades and levels have exceeded my expectations. So my averages on my common things are actually better in, in many cases. My students no longer follow directions from a cookbook experiment like they used to. I show them a phenomenon of a real-world experience, and they're now asking questions and designing experiments that will best answer their questions that they generate. They're completing CERs, which is a nice new acronym for you, which includes claims, evidence, and reasoning. These are the same type of CERs that are often used in social studies and English classes. My biology honor students were recently presented with a real-life little girl named Addie that became very sick very quickly. It's a frontline video um, on her story. It doesn't tell them the answer. The students were then asked to make a claim, an explanation as to why they thought she got sick so quickly. They, were then, fo then, they, uh, they then followed up with their experiments and using math models they were able to provide evidence and develop a scientific explanation that included scientific vocabulary that was new to them to provide an answer to their original problem of why Addie got sick so quickly. In oceanography, uh, an upper level course that's very heterogeneous, students studied our Fairfield coastline and the effects of Hurricane Sandy and climate change. They're currently engineering an actual solution to prevent coastal erosion for future climate change events in Fairfield. What has been most surprising to me doing these next-gen standards and the strategies that come along with it is my students are asking questions they've never asked me before, questions I truly don't know the answers to. What makes this even more exciting is their desire to answer the question. Students are no longer accepting of my standard, I don't know, response. They're seeking the answers and they want them. They're using the technology they have in the classroom to answer these questions beyond my expectations and knowledge. I'm talking college level stuff that I I've never seen. Then they take their new learning and they apply it to what we're actually doing to create a deeper understanding of the conce concepts they're learning in class. In my five months of NGSS implementation, I have learned more from my students than I have in the past 18 years. So I've been very impressed by the whole the whole situation. So. so for this uh, portion of the presentation, I just wanted to summarize uh, a little bit about the, the differences between the science and engineering and also look at the commonalities. In science, we're looking at identifying phenomena and asking questions about the phenomena. Students have opportunities to investigate uh, that phenomena, gather observable data, analyze it, and then make some, draw some conclusions based on that evidence. Uh, in engineering, students are identifying human needs. Uh, again, they're asking questions, but they're asking questions to define problems. They're designing those solutions, testing the solutions, redesigning the solutions, uh, and retesting to solve, to solve uh, human problems or human needs. Now I'd like to walk you through the anatomy of the science documents. Each document is set up in the same way. So you can choose to look at a document that you have in front of you, although we have screenshots of them up here. In the introductory pages of the document, you will find the enduring understandings, the most important takeaways from the course or grade level. Then you will see the course essential questions, followed by the course or semester, at a glance, which shows the units and their essential questions. So this basically just gives you an overview of what are we going to be working on in this particular course. Next we'll take a look at an individual unit, and you can see there's a heredity theme here through the whole presentation. So this is the heredity unit in the biology document at the high school level. Um, you'll see the title of the unit. And then there's a unit overview. It gives a short summary um, of the big ideas. The unit performance expectations, those are the things in the middle box. Those are the things that the teachers 
are responsible to make sure their students are able to do by the end of the unit. And the unit essential questions are also included. In addition to the performance expectations that weave all three dimensions of the standards together, the cross-cutting concepts, disciplinary core ideas, and science and engineering practices are listed out separately for clarification. That's so if a teacher needs to drill down a little further um, as to exactly what it is that students need to be able to do, this gives them a, a little bit more explanation. And then lastly, we show the links to the Connecticut core standards in ELA and in mathematics. I'm very excited about this slide. <laughs> One of the goals of the revision of our high school program was to offer more choice to our high school students while still providing a rich and well-rounded program. Students are better able to select courses that fit with their passion and their aspirations beyond high school. You will notice that beginning next year, all grade nine students will be entering high school in biology. The possibilities after that are much greater than in our current system. We are very proud of the hard work and professional discussions the teachers went through to arrive at this rigorous but flexible high school program. We have two brand new courses being proposed, the chemistry of medicine and the chemistry of nutrition. In addition, our former earth science course has been broken up into four different semester courses. Now just for clarification, the L that you see in some places stands for life science, the E stands for earth and space science, and the P stands for physical science. Any course with an asterisk is a semester course as opposed to a year-long course. And I am happy to report that based on our preliminary numbers, and they are preliminary, all of these courses are well subscribed. So now I'm going to put my steam hat on. The integration of several fields has created steam, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. I am very excited to talk to you about a new opportunity for our students in grades three, four, and five next year. In addition to the grades three, four, and five science curricula, we are very excited to have the opportunity to add an additional STEAM component to those grade levels next year. The intention of the program is to augment the science curricula in a fun and engaging way by allowing students to have an additional opportunity to act as scientists and engineers. This program will bring the science to life while incorporating the engineering and technology standards that are part of our new standards. The unit titles are in line with the new elementary units, with the exception of one exciting addition. All students in grades three, four, and five will have a STEAM unit on coding. This will be in addition to the instruction they receive as part of the library media curriculum. And we have coordinated with those educators to ensure that we can take students even further than they go now. While many of us are familiar with STEM, the A, arts, can sometimes raise questions. <coughs> we need to broaden our definition of art to include creativity, physical design, functionality, and aesthetics. Here you can see an example of how the A fits in. I will refer you back to the two most recent presentations you've heard. In the technology education update, you heard about students working on architecture. And in the library media update, WIXI drawings were discussed. These are both examples of the A in STEAM. In these photos, the student work on the left shows the front and back of a journal page. Students used LED lights, see that little white dot on the far left? That's the LED. To illuminate their journals in the electric circuits unit in grade four, they were learning about open and closed circuits, which you can see in the, on the back page. The gold circle is the battery and the tape is the wire. The students on the right are designing a cargo boat to prevent containers from sliding in rough seas and damaging the goods inside. They need to work as teams and capitalize on each other's knowledge and strengths, just as engineers do every day.
So we're going <clears> to <throat> now discuss a little bit about how we plan to evaluate uh, the newly imp implemented curricula as well as the uh, next steps. So we'll use multiple measures uh, to evaluate the success of the curriculum. Here you can see list uh, you can see them here listed here. We'll be analyzing student work uh, as we move through the progress uh, process. Uh, the performance assessments will provide us with some data. Teacher feedback is very important um, as we move through the process uh, and I'm sure it will evolve as our students evolve too. Um, observations in the classroom as well as the state assessment data. Um, just as a note, and I'm just going to state it one more time, this year we are doing the field test of the next generation science standards instead of the Connecticut mastery tests in grades 5, 8, and 10, actually uh, uh, grade 11. Um, and this is uh, occurring across the state of Connecticut this year. Um, however, that data will not be reported back to the school, so we will not be receiving any information on it this year. Uh, it is a transition year moving from the CMT to the next generation science standard. So again, we have multiple uh, points of information to gather uh, to look at the implementation and how successful it will be. So some of the next steps. With the Board of Education's uh, approval of these documents, uh, we'll be working on the implementation gr uh, guides uh, for grades 9 through 12, um, as well as the grades 3 through 5 uh, River Lab. Uh, we are still maintaining River Lab. We just need to update it and align it with the next generation science standards, um, as well as the STEAM uh, for grades 3, 4, and 5. Uh, that work uh, we plan on, uh, we're, we've already begun some of that, uh, uh, looking, exploring it, some of that work already, um, but plan to do that this summer. And we'll also, uh, the common assessments will be forthcoming. We've also done considerable amount of uh, professional development, as uh, was noted earlier in this presentation, on inquiry. However, there's still a lot more work to be done uh, that will continue throughout the implementation of these new standards. Teachers will continue to work collaboratively and plan in small groups as well as a wider department. And we also uh, plan on bring, bringing more content uh, information and professional development down to our elementary folks as well over the next couple of years. What you're looking at here is really just a snapshot of the timeline just to give you a sense of the rollout of the curriculum. So just one note, River Lab you see is up there twice, uh, summer writing this summer and next summer. That program has been with us for over 50 years. Uh, it is not something that changes in two weeks in the, during the summer. Uh, we do anticipate a significant amount of work, uh, but are very excited about the direction that it will take. One of my favorite scientists, Neil deGrasse Tyson, said the following about how students learn to be scientists. While we aren't planning on breaking things, unless that's the task, I know you can all relate to this if you think back to your own childhood, that natural curiosity about how and why things work. We plan to capitalize on that and build on it to create future scientists and engineers. So we would like to extend our sincere thanks uh, to all those teachers, administrators, and community members who work so hard on this curriculum. Uh, it is through their dedication and passion for their students and through the, their subject matter that we are able to bring, them, uh, bring you this program tonight. Uh, there are so many, uh, we will not read the list, but we just have provided you, uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, groups of participants uh, that took part. We also want to acknowledge the uh, teachers, again, who are here this evening. Uh, for supporting this, um, and we want to thank you for this opportunity to present you with the new science curriculum. Thank you very much.
you were thanked at the beginning, but let me thank you at the end of your presentation. It was a thorough presentation, and I very much appreciate the work that went into it. I see some people went back to the audience rather than. <laughs> it's called retreat. Take uh, <laughs> questions, but but you're welcome to uh, ask for a lifeline if a question comes to and you want to uh, draw on long people. Mrs. Gerber, you have a question. I do um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm not a particularly uh, much of a, a science person, so um, but going through all of this, it's it's very easy to kind of go through and see where where things are going. Um, one question I had. Um, is would we be able to get a copy of the the PowerPoint presentation? Um, it just because you know there were just some things I'd like to kind of go back over and look at again, um, and it was kind of going quickly. So if we could get copies of that, that would be really great. We can absolutely provide that. It'll also be posted on the district's website. Perfect. Um, but we can get you hard copies if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. That would be great. Um, then um, one thing you mentioned was that there were um, after the parent teacher focus groups, um, you made some revisions. Um, with, was there anything specific um, kind of uh, that came out of those that any what the revisions were I guess if there are any detail to that just um, I mean I can speak to the secondary and then if, if Walter has something to add I'll let him do that okay. um, the community focus groups um, we had quite a few um, science people in those focus groups which was really great because they you know they work in the real world in this in this field every day they asked us some questions that caused us to go back and clarify um, just you know some of the some of the statements in the documents um, they also um, made some suggestions uh, that we will put into our implementation guides about how you know how we will um, get this information across to students um, we met with the uh, River Lab folks who gave us some really good feedback um, and helped us to figure out you know where best to place River Lab in each of the grades um, it will remain in middle school as well and I'm working um, on that portion Walter's working on the elementary portion of that um, and the teachers gave us a phenomenal amount of actually actually the teachers wrote these um, and you know I think that's critically important because they're the ones who have to actually deliver this you know they're they're the ones on the ground with the students and so um, they, the reason that they deserve uh, a tremendous amount of credit and a huge thank you is that um, they put in the time and effort to write these in a way that they felt would best meet the needs of all of their students. Um, and you know, we consulted with special educators, we consulted with library media specialists, we, we involved a lot of people in this dialogue. So um, you know, there, were, there was a lot of back and forth um, revision that went on in that regard um, and uh, you know I'm you know I'll, I'll I say this publicly a lot but I I'll say it here because it's on TV so then everybody gets to everybody gets to hear it um, I um, I have worked in in four other school districts in a capacity similar to this and I have never worked with a finer group of science educators than the people I work with here they're just amazing <laughs> I think Mr. Wakeman is gonna. I just, I, um, from the elementary level, I just want to echo a lot of what uh, Patricia just said. Um, it was uh, the feedback, particularly from parents, was very helpful around clarity of language, um, and there were some questions. They were very knowledgeable about NGSS, which I was very pleased uh, to hear because the, it was critical feedback, which was helpful. Uh, to give you an example, um, the NGSS has uh, bundled <laughs> the standards as well as uh, in either thematically or topically and school districts are looking at both ways and that help us to reflect on what do we want to do here in Fairfield and what, be uh, what uh, best meets the needs for our students. Um, to be honest at the elementary level it's kind of a blend but we do think of it more thematically than, than topically. So that's just an example uh, of some of those questions. That dialogue is very helpful and again uh, the teacher authors um, are immersed in the documents um, and when it was shared with teachers across the districts you're getting perspective from many teachers interpreting the documents their feedback is helpful because it's um, uh, it, it helps to meet the needs of students across the entire town um, and think about all of the constituents and the, the students that we have so that again the feedback groups the focus groups are very helpful for us 
Um, and then just one other question, and I apologize if this was mentioned at some other point. Um, this is regarding the high school, the change to having the biology freshman year. Um, and so that's going to be implemented in the 18-19 school year. That's correct, next fall. So <clears throat> what happens to the students who are freshmen this year who took Earth Science? Will they be able to take bio next year? So yes. For one year. We're going to have a bubble of bio students. Bio is going to be We're going to have a bubble of bio, yes. Got it. Um, we're going to have a bubble of biology students. Um, and we've planned for this as far as, you know, teacher certification and resources and all of that. Um, because, uh, you know, that's been our plan from the beginning. So, um, so the students who are currently in earth science will move forward to biology just as they would have in the prior system. And then all of our incoming ninth graders will be taking biology as well. Right. And you have enough bio teachers to we do. do that. Yeah. We're, we're, okay. we, we, we have, um, we're very fortunate in this district. Um, we have a, quite a number of people who have multiple areas of certification in science. Science is one of those things where you're not just certified in science. You're certified in biology or chemistry or physics or earth science. We have quite a number of people who have many, many certifications. And so we're able to swing those people. They're, if you're a baseball fan like I am, you know, they're like the utility player. They can play in multiple places. Um, and so for next year, we'll be swinging some of those people to pick up some of that extra biology. Um, and then the following year, They'll, they'll swing back. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Peterson. Hi again, thank you for the presentation. It's very, uh, uh, it's very informative. And, and I, as, as somebody who's a big fan of uh, getting more critical science thought uh, into all of our uh, students, I, I like the, that the standards uh, have that, all that kind of cross-cutting concepts. Uh, broadly applicable. I think that's great. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Some, some are small, some are somewhat larger. Uh, I guess one of, the, one of the things that I noticed primarily was it seems that there's a larger emphasis on, on the hands-on, pretty much at every level. And I was wondering kind of how is that going to impact the proportion of, you know, the kind of guide on the side versus the actual lab work, um, you know, which obviously I think in elementary it's a lot of hands-on blocks and, and stuff, but it, it's more regimented in some ways at the high school level. I was just kind of curious how that balance was going to work out. I want to make sure that I understand your question before I answer the wrong question. <laughs> um, so as I understand it, what you're, what you're asking is, um, you know, with the emphasis on hands-on, when are we going to have the opportunity to um, cover the content in addition to doing that hands-on That's stuff. a more elegant way to answer okay. my question. I just wanted to make sure I understood it no, properly. I, thank you. Um, and uh, the way that um, these new standards are designed, the content is embedded in the hands-on experiences that students are doing. So it's not a one or the other. We're doing both at the same time. Um, and so, you know, it's the way that the teacher structures the lesson or the unit is very deliberate so that the students will cover the content without the teacher standing in front of them every single day. Now that's not to say there won't be direct instruction. There's still a need for direct instruction. You know, students are, are going to need background information and all of that. Um, but they will be doing a lot of the questioning and designing of the experiments that are going to answer the questions that lead them to that content and the teachers are very skilled at making <laughs> sure that they guide them in the right direction and that's that kind of feeds into another question that I had about the uh, about the that exact issue uh, rather than working out of kind of this received wisdom of this is the this is the experimental structure I assume that at, at almost every level the teacher is going to function kind of as a as a funnel and you know be able to say if someone comes up with a an idea that you know m may not ultimately illustrate that the, the point that the lessons trying to make say well hey maybe we can look at something else but I, I so I, I I take it that that's your you would you would agree that's you know, it's a guide right? yes uh, yeah. so so you know um as a teacher you want to give your students choice and freedom but it's limited choice and freedom so, you know, you don't want someone going off in a complete, you know, wrong direction. And as I said, you know, our, our teachers are very skilled at making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, we've provided them with uh, 
you know, professional development, and you heard a little bit about that, but we, you know, we have to continue that. That's essential in order for this um, to really be 100% successful. Well, I imagine that kind of frontline experience is also extremely useful. I mean, there's no, there's no better trainer than actually fielding, a, you know, 12 different uh, experimental design concepts. Right. Well, it's kind of like, I, I liken it to learning to drive. You know, you watch someone drive your whole life, yeah. and then you get behind the wheel, and all of a sudden it doesn't look so easy. Um, at least it didn't for me. So, um, you know, we, we are supporting the teachers, um, and it will be, you know, kind of a learn as you go. The great news about this group is that they are an extremely collaborative group, and um, we actually, um, Dr. Jones, Mr. Cummings, and myself met with all the high school teachers um, a couple months back to talk to them about what they felt their needs were and, um, you know, we, uh, what came through loud and clear was the need for them to have collaborative planning time, and so we are actually putting that into their daily schedules next year to ensure that they're going to have the time they need um, to do that. Um, just one, one kind of uh, informational question about the uh, grade three to five coding that you're mm -hmm. implementing. Uh, is, that, is that scratch or is it something? Um, it, it feels like at a lot of levels we're doing scratch. And well, we're, like we're currently using code.org, um, which is um, a website. First of all, it's been, um, you know, vetted and, and they've signed the privacy policy with Connecticut. So, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, which programs we choose to use to make sure that they're compliant with that. Um, but the library media specialists are using it, um, and so, uh, you know, our feeling, or at least my feeling is right now, um, we're going to stick with that simply because we don't want students working on two different platforms at the same time um, at that age level. Um, so uh, they, they learn um, the skills, you know, it builds obviously over time. I was in an eighth grade classroom today where in their technology class they were actually um, learning how to um, allow, uh, create a game and how to register the score. In other words, what's the code you put in so that when someone answers correctly, the score goes up by one. Um, and, uh, it, you know, some of the kids were, I, I mean, I was, I have to tell you, I was amazed. I was totally out of my element. And, and you know, they were way beyond my skill set when it came to that kind of thing. Um, but uh, so we're going to stick with we're going to stick with what's currently being used in the district, um, and just um, try to add on to it. Thanks very much. Other questions? This is Maxine Canelli. Okay. Um, again, thank you so much for the presentation. I have to start with a uh, what happened to the tanker? Oh. <laughs> What do you think happened? I don't know. I don't believe I have enough data from which to f make a claim. I can I'm hear the science teachers behind me right now laughing at my question, right? <laughs> um, so what happened with the tanker was that um, that, that, occurred, yeah, that occurred in Canada in the wintertime. They steam cleaned the tanker the night before, so it was warm. And then overnight, what happens in Canada in the wintertime? Or the summer. Uh, well, okay, depending <laughs> on what part of Canada you're from, that's true. Um, it, you know, the analogy is you, you go into a, a novelty store in the middle of January when it's zero degrees outside and you buy a balloon, and then you walk outside. What happens? So it's, 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 a, it's a gas law situation where as the temperature goes down, um, the pressure goes down and the tanker just implodes. Uh, you should have as, as part of the presentation what some of the student guesses were because <laughs> they, they, they'll be fearless about uh, I'll it. tell you some of the student guesses about the the other um, the ice cubes yes if you'd like to know sure but I, I'd like to hear some one guess first S one of them has salt in it see that's a very typical student guess <laughs> but if you ever if you put an ice cube in water with salt what happens to it no, it, actually float more. it still floats Okay, so so you're you're the ringer. I you know I was going to have a conversation with Trish Pitko to tell her not to give the answer away <laughs> when she was if she was here. Um, no, one of one of those liquids is isopropyl alcohol, and so it's a density problem. Ice is denser than isopropyl alcohol, but less dense than water, and so you know. But the kids usually go for 
you doctored the ice cube. That's, the, that's their go-to. <laughs> Um, you did something to that ice cube, like it's fake, you know, it's a plastic ice cube with a weight in it, like they come up with all kinds of stuff. Um, the great news about that is that they are really thinking about what is happening, you know, like a real scientist would, like I see something that doesn't make sense to me and I need to find an answer for that. So, so now you can't give the secrets away because we might use those. I just had to know about the tanker. <laughs> so, um, however, that's actually a perfect segue to my next question, which is about time. Because obviously that process just here in microcosm, that is going to take a tremendous amount of time. So has there been a reduction of content in order to allow that process to take place? And separately with that is the issue of the elementary schools, because I know there's been, and I, I can't quote the exact numbers, but I know that between social studies and science, They've only had a certain amount of time allocated, and it's, the school day isn't getting longer. So I was wondering, you know, for both of these, how is this working? That's right. Um, actually, what is, very <clears throat> excuse me, what is very exciting about uh, bringing forward the new science curriculum um, is there will be a content, we'll be able to converge um, content areas. So for example, uh, we are already um, purchasing um, nonfiction resources for literacy, so as they're teaching uh, reading and nonfiction, they can teach nonfiction and use resources that support the social studies unit or that support the science unit um, so that you can integrate the content areas a little bit more. Um, and when you start talking about students being able to identify questions and using evidence, again, that's sort of a theme that goes through it. As far as the content specifically, um, the, the plan forward is moving with uh, six-week units both in the social studies and in the um, science alternating as we go through the course of the year to address those content areas. Um, so they will be mapped out. Um, that was part of the task that the teachers were given, or the parameters I should say, in designing these units just to think about that's the amount of time that you have for these units. How are we going to structure this? The real work is the interpretation of that as we develop the implementation guides that supports the teacher's implementation. And so the teachers have, our, especially in the elementary schools obviously, will have some freedom to make suggestions, because I know right now we try to make it clear that, you know, every grade and across all the schools are following a similar schedule, that there will be guaranteed a certain amount of time allocated to math or to reading or to science, et cetera. Is there freedom if they say, well, we would like to move things or at all? I mean, obviously, it'd be part of a district-wide conversation, but... Right. The, the implementation guides really are guides to help support the teacher in the implementation. It, it provides them with what are the big ideas in this unit that we want kids to know and to be able to do. And as you know, students come in with, with varying degrees of understanding, so they may already have some background knowledge that teachers can skip over certain portions and move on. Other times they may have a, a group of students where they need to, to uh, continue and further build uh, the foundational understandings. That goes on all the time in all content areas. Um, so there is that flexibility that teachers have um, in that implementation. So a lot of that is going to be individual teacher planning. But as far as the implementation guides, that's uh, to help support and, and structure what are the big ideas we want students to take away from this unit, uh, what do we expect as far as performance expectations. And so there's some flexibility in how we get there, but it's, uh, those expectations need to be very clear in those documents. And so what about in the high school then, where you don't you have notice enough? I, I moved the microphone right yeah, over. Yeah, I was yeah. just, wait, just <laughs> checking. Um, so where obviously you don't, you, you, the, science, the science bio teacher is not going to be able to, you know, say to the ELA teacher, um, I need this read in your class. Oh, we're not? Well, um, I'm just joking. Yeah. Um, what, what actually um, has happened with these new standards is um, they, they are focused um, on concepts rather than what I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but rather than minutia. So for instance, um, if you take a topic like mitosis, which is cell division, um, for the hundred years that I've been in education, um, we have taught students every individual phase and the name of the phase and what it looks like. Do you all remember this from biology class? Okay, so how many of you could name them all in order? It's good that none of you raised your hand because it would have ruined my point. Um, and <laughs> so, so what these new standards have done is students still need to understand cell division. They need to understand mitosis. But they don't need to memorize the name of every phase. 
So they are, we're looking at um, the concept in a context rather than just, okay, today we're doing mitosis and tomorrow we're doing meiosis and the next day we're doing, you know, um, I don't know, genetic mutations in DNA, you know, following all of these, um, you know, little bitty um, memorization kinds of tasks. Um, and the beauty in that is that it does give the teacher some freedom and flexibility. Um, if they have a, a it's, it's not to say the teachers aren't allowed to go into that level of depth, but the curriculum, as you know, is kind of the minimum standard, right? Teachers can always go beyond it. They just can't choose to not do something that's in the curriculum. Um, the focus of NGSS is really for students to become better um, critical thinkers and problem solvers. And so a lot of that memorization um, type of stuff has come out. So another, a middle school example, for instance. Um, in middle school, uh, on the old CMT, students were expected to memorize the first 20 elements of the periodic table. Why? Because it's great for cocktail parties. Okay. <laughs> you know, it, it, no English teacher sends Later a child, well, no English teacher that I know of in middle school sends a child home to memorize the first three pages of the dictionary. And that's pretty much what memorizing the first 20 elements of the periodic table is. So it's more important that they understand how to use it. And that's the focus of these new standards. So as far as the time factor, um, you know, these curricula are designed to be able to be taught in the time that's given. Um, but th we are going to be doing things differently. Um, and so, you know, we're going to take some of that memorization piece out because in all truthfulness, every piece of research you could read, and I know you're well aware of this, you know, if you gave a child the same final exam in September that they took in June, they remember approximately 5% of the factual, you know, minutia that you taught them. It's, it's the big ideas, it's the connections they make, um, it's the skills that they develop that are really important. Which is, once again, a perfect segue to the next point, that while I'm, I'm definitely familiar with that idea of the June versus the September um, administration of an exam, if you're the honors bio teacher and then you've got the AP bio teacher, you know, what I'm always curious about is that underlying foundational content, you know, almost as a list that that AP bio teacher can count on. Yes, you may have addressed these enduring understandings and essential questions, but I know you know mitosis. I mean, I'm not going to try to. Telophase, anaphase, or, or okay, yeah, I'll name that, them. That, that there would be, that I'll mix them up and ask you to order them. Yeah. Um, that there be, though, those certain basic factual elements that while absolutely there may need to be review, you know, that there, there is that cycle to it, but that there is an absolute expectation that you would be familiar with this term, know how it applies, might need a quick review, but you're ready to take it to that next level. Is that spelled out it, somewhere? It is, it is spelled out in the implementation guides. Okay. Um, it's also found, I mentioned it um, in the presentation very briefly, so um, it's also found in the fact that the AP practices are nearly identical to the NGSS practices. Um, and so we've aligned, you know, we've aligned our content to ensure that our students who are going to go on to AP, um, as a result of our, you know, our choice to open that up more for students, um, to make sure that they're going to be prepared. So they will be familiar. Like I said, there's still a place for direct instruction. They're still going to have to know certain vocabulary terms and all of those things. Um, but we're, you know, it's not going to be identical to what we do now. No, I mean, those sound like very reasonable adjustments. So that's, those were great examples. Um, I guess one other question I'll ask right now, and then I'll decide if I want to ask the other ones. Um, the tests themselves in terms of what's going to be different for our teachers who this field test that, of course, bothers me to a degree that we're getting used as guinea pigs, to, and I know the state needs the data, um, but that we get absolutely no feedback, no sample questions. I'm sure any released material is at a bare minimum. Um, that puts us obviously in a tough position. I don't know if we're allowed to speak with the students afterward to pick their brains for what they can remember from the test. Um, but we're not allowed to if they find out about it. Yeah, I didn't yeah. think so. But um, 
What, how do oh, you no, see, we don't do that. How do you see us adjusting, I mean, fifth grade, eighth grade, then I know specifically with the 11th grade science, there are the four science fields, three years to cover them in, and most students will not be doubling up on science. So, I mean, those are kind of two separate issues of fifth grade, eighth grade, and then that 11th grade test, 11th again specifically with the issue of the four sciences. Okay. Do you want to speak to the fifth grade? Sure. Uh, in the fifth grade, and there are a few sample questions on the online right now that we're able to use uh, just to give us a sense of what the questions are like. Um, and there really are, and this is the same thing with the, the uh, Common Core or the, the Smarter Balanced uh, Assessments for, for Math and Language Arts, they're really focused more on, on the critical thinking, providing students with information and having them think about uh, their responses rather than fact recall. Um, it does require some uh, base knowledge, uh, for example, about the content itself in order to apply it. Um, but there is also uh, information and evidence in the text that they provide or in the data that they provide um, that students can uh, reason through some of the problems too. So that at the elementary level, that it is um, at, at this point, and again, I haven't seen the, the assessments other than the, the sample questions that they provided, but that seems to be the direction that they're going in. Um, and also, I've just went uh, recently to a presentation about the uh, NGS uh, and w what they're planning on doing in terms of the assessments. Uh, the state is planning on releasing a significant number of items uh, this coming fall okay. that schools can then use uh, to help understand, uh, help students understand essentially what is, uh, how this test is designed and what the test questions are going to be, uh, what they'll look like. And the fact that elementary, the fifth graders will be taking it in the spring of 2019 when we don't even have the new curriculum implemented till the following year. <clears throat> right. So we, uh, I anticipate that we'll be going through, actually I know, we will be going through a transition. Our fifth graders will be taking this um, with uh, probably the least amount of preparation just because they're in fifth grade already. Um, and uh, so we will do be uh, developing transition implementation guides as we move through this process. Um, I think we're at an advantage for a number of reasons. Um, when I met with area districts, um, Fairfield is bringing their documents forward. A lot of districts have not done that yet. Um, so we are not alone in this, uh, in, in where we are in our process. Um, but that being said, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. And I'm not able to recall it. Do you remember? Do you <laughs> I was going with you, so that, that's yeah. okay. Um, but if you anyway, restated so the question, would that help? The, the, the preparation for students um, in, in grade five. So I think um, as we are going through this, that will be our baseline data. And we're going to look at w how do our students perform. It'll give us, when we finally do get some information back, it'll give us guidance on where do we need to tweak our mm -hmm. documents? How do we need to uh, better adjust them as we move forward? Um, that, in, including teacher feedback, is going to be extremely helpful uh, as, as we move forward through this process. So. I think Mrs. Jacobson wants to follow up on that sure. line of question. Just because it was on the same area. So I just want to add a quick follow up um, to Mrs. Max and Kennelly's question. Um, the state's timeline for implementation on their website has the pilot test happening next year in 2020 being the full implementation. Do we have any information about why this was pushed up to this year? Uh, part of that is because the state, um, ha they've been really pushing forward um, or wanting to push forward moving over to migrating over to the next generation science standard uh, assessment. Um, in, uh, in part, the, the state adopted these um, in uh, 2015 and uh, so we're trying to, to move everything forward. Uh, what they were trying to avoid was um, taking two high stakes assessments simultaneously in the same year. Um, we do have a transition year. They were, uh, they had to apply to the feds to get permission um, not to take the CMT uh, this year. The feds did give uh, the state of Connecticut uh, permission to do that. Um, and so that's why this year is a, a, you know, again, a year that doesn't count, so to speak, uh, and why we don't get any feedback or data from it. Um, and why we're going to be moving forward with, with the implementation of the full test for next year. Yes, I know that we have the waiver for this year. I was just wondering why they didn't do it next year along with their timeline that is actually still on their own websites. So I'm not trying to make you answer for this date. I just think it gives us a year less time, right? And our students a less year time to before they actually are being tested. Um, and to that further point on that, their timeline also contemplated rolling these out in certain grades, giving them 
in the grades that would be tested first, meaning certain grades in elementary, certain grades in middle, certain grades at high, so that they would have two years before they actually were taking the test. Was there a reason why we didn't do it that way rather than by level? Just curious why we didn't take that suggestion from them and did it kind of high school first and then lower. Just because they, it did seem to me that it contemplated two years of instruction prior to the testing, but so just curious why we didn't go with that way. Right. I just will speak to the elementary level right now. Okay. Um, the elementary teachers, again, are a single teacher in the classroom teaching all content areas. We are uh, currently rolling out um, the new social studies units. Um, we are full into the, the whole SRBI process. There's a lot on their plates at the moment. Plus, um, as you can see, I hope with the presentation we gave you tonight, there's a lot of professional development and background information that we need to help support teachers before we just hand them, here's implement the new science. So these are works that are already, uh, we're already um, trying to support as we're moving forward, as I mentioned, the nonfiction reading resources um, in our uh, elementary classrooms to help support the, that, that connection, uh, engage kids in thinking and asking questions. So that work is already going on. Um, it is an ongoing process, um, but that's, Just that's where we are. A lot going on at that le I understand. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, Jen. It's okay. Mrs. Maxson, but can I back to you? And 8th and 12th, 8th uh, and 11th grade. So I'm sorry, could you repeat your sure. question? It's so been a while. Just the idea that um, it's, well, too so I mean, obviously, 8th grade, there's the issue of the, and I haven't acquainted myself yet completely with how radically or not the middle school curriculum has been changed beyond what you just said in terms of the minutia. Um, but certainly high school, there's the situation of and a, a test after three years mm -hmm. on four year four topics. Correct. And so, how what do you, what's in place for preparing students for that? Well, we hit. First of all, we have um, options for students to take, um, you know, physical science, earth science, and life science if they choose to do so. Um, we are choosing not to mandate that they take one of each because we want to give students the flexibility to follow a pathway that makes sense for them. Um, however, um, you know, in thinking about the test, um, it's not unlike what we've been doing with CAPT all along. You know, CAPT was given in 10th grade. It was basically three sciences and you only had two years. So what we ended up doing was um, weaving some of the um, you know, for students who began in earth science, they had earth science and biology, and then they took the test and they never had a physical science. So um, we ended up weaving some of that um, physical science into their earlier courses. Um, with this, it's going to be a, a little bit different. I, you know, I, again, I've only seen the four high school sample questions um, that the state has given us as practice for the students. Um, and what they, what they look like is they, they give the students a scenario. So they, you know, there's a, a little paragraph or something that describes um, either some kind of phenomena or uh, an experiment that someone's done or um, whatever. And then students are asked, um, you know, four or five questions about that scenario. And um, it's set up such that they have to, um, they have to actually physically um, design an experiment to test, you know, whatever their, their guess is about what's happening. Um, so we will, you know, in the interim next year, we'll probably end up creating some review information that we'll provide to students um, in 11th grade because, you know, they haven't had any of this instruction. They're going to walk into 11th grade, have instruction, you know, in the new curriculum for one year and go take the test. So we will, we will end up providing some, um, some preparation in other areas for them to utilize. Um, as we roll this out and as we have students, you know, kind of go through the whole process, that will become less necessary. Um, but, uh, you know, the state only mandates two years of science. We have a three-year mandate, thankfully. Um, but uh, nobody mandates four years of science and even if they did they wouldn't give the test in 12th grade because they wouldn't get the results before the kids would leave us so you know we're faced with the same sort of situation um, 
you know, with some students in math who may not be, you know, who may be um, taking algebra as a freshman and may not get to the point um, where the SAT is mm -hmm. in junior year, we're faced with the same sort of situation. So we're, you know, the plan is to create some some support materials for the 11th graders next year to make sure that they are as prepared as they can be. Um, you know, we haven't quite worked out what that's going to look like yet. Thank you. And other questions? Um, Ms. Leeper. This might be best question for Dr. Jones, but were we mandated to take the pilot this year or was it a ch district choice between pilot and CMT? Uh, it was not um, a choice. It was not a choice. Every district, all 169 towns in Connecticut are taking the field test at grades 5, 8, and 11. So <clears throat> has it been like reported to the state that the metadata they're going to get on the items, because the pilot test isn't meant to inform the item bank, won't necessarily be particularly informative of, obviously in preaching to the choir, you know this, if we haven't rolled out the new standards. Has that, has this district reported that to the state, that this pilot will likely not inform the metadata for the item uh, bank? I have had that conversation with the state. Um, how can I say this? <laughs> um, it's they, on they, they listened um, and said thank you. And um, trains rolling down the track. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. They have a contract. Um, I just wanted to I interject. I think I might have gone out of order if. No. But we were on. No, you were called on next. So, do you have any other questions? Sh sure. Um, so, thank you for this presentation. I always get so excited to see the movement towards inquiry-based instruction. I think kids are so engaged um, in that way. And so, I was wondering how many hours per week of science instruction do our elementary students receive currently? All right, so it, um, it's about 45 minutes a day, um, five days, or well, we're on a six-day cycle, but it is. Um, I'm so happy to hear that. I h had been under the impression that elementary students didn't have science every day, and that I was like really out of touch thinking that science, that our elementary school students did get science every day. Right, so that caveat I'm going to say right now, and this is something that um, as we're moving forward, we're looking to um, standardize this as we move forward across the district. Um, there is some discrepancy across the district right now uh, with our current program and there's also a little discrepancy between what is taught when. Um, teachers in the past have had a choice as to uh, which unit they would teach first. Um, there has been some flexibility around that. Uh, given the um, content standards and the, and the raised rigor in all of them, uh, we're really examining that and providing teachers with pacing guides on to help support how to implement and integrate, um, particularly when we're thinking about aligning when we're doing a nonfiction unit in uh, language arts. How does that support the social studies? How might that support the, and, and so it's helpful to have all those pieces lined up and, and the same thing with uh, math units and that kind of thing. So those are the questions that we are putting on the table as we start to move forward um, and to think about how best to um, capitalize on the instructional minutes that we have or the limited instructional minutes that we have with kids. I think that's awesome. Um, and then also, I think in the elementary school, the idea that you're pushing um, engineering is really exciting. And I was wondering if you gave any thought into ways to particularly engage girls in the engineering components. And I know it might just happen organically because previously kids weren't traditionally introduced to engineering at that age. Um, but I was wondering if that is something you guys gave any thought to and kind of help, you know, with the gender disparity in engineering later in life. Um, I'm married to an engineer, so, <laughs> so I have a little resource. Um, but uh, we, we are going to be um, writing the, the STEAM units this summer. Um, that is something that we've talked about, you know, making sure that we have units that engage all learners you know, whether they're, you know, high performing, struggling learners, girls, boys, you know, whatever, however you want to slice and dice the, um, the groups of, of students. Um, one of the key facts that we've spoken about, um, and some of the folks who helped uh, with writing those frameworks are here tonight, some of the library media specialists and the math science teachers, um, is that we, we do want to give kids choice in, you know, in what it is that 
um, they're working on. So within um, the unit, you know, uh, which will be tied to their science unit, um, we want to be able to give them some choice. And I think that, you know, when you give a student choice, they tend to be more engaged than if you give them a specific task. Um, so we're going to present them with, you know, not, you know, every possible opportunity under the sun, but an, an array of possibilities, and they can choose um, from that array of possibilities what problem they want to work on to try to solve. Um, there will need to be some pre-instruction done, you know, especially, well, first, in the first year in all three grades um, about, you know, wh what this is because students haven't had this in their classroom setting before. Um, and so we're going to use um, some instruction in the QFT protocol, which I think you've heard about before, um, and things like that. And uh, so there'll be some kind of introductory things going on. And then we won't have to do that with um, next year's fourth and fifth graders because they will have, you know, they will have gone through it once. We'll only have to do it with the third graders each year from, from then on. Um, but I do think it's exciting. And, um, you know, anybody who's had uh, children that age and has watched them, you know, uh, take things apart to see how they work um, knows that, you know, that's, that's, fascinating for kids in that age group and their their natural curiosity really drives it so I have two little boys almost two and almost four so the idea of breaking things to figure out how they work is <laughs> so you like that Neil deGrasse Tyson life. quote about breaking yes, things okay perfect. that's good can I ask one last question um, I really loved the idea of presenting students with uh, phenomena or problems that don't have a real solution necessarily uh, we as a board this year have heard a lot about grading across the district and so I was curious when students are prevented with a uh, phenomenon or a challenge like that that might not have a specific set solution what will the grading be like is it the CER that you guys mentioned or is there a rubric or um, it, it'll depend on on what the task is that students are doing um, and uh, so um, you know it, it may be a rubric that um, students are given ahead of time where their solution has to meet certain criteria. Um, and that will probably be the most likely way that we assess those things because that allows for variety in a, in a, you know, a student response. Um, and you know, in the real world of science and engineering, there isn't one right way to fix a problem. There isn't one right answer. Um, so there are many answers and uh, you know the the funniest part about this um, is that some students are very uncomfortable with there being more than one right answer so that's something that we have to work with them on is is that it's okay if you and your neighbor have different answers they can both be right um, and so that's you know that's part of the work that we have to do with students is to build that culture about you know, understanding that real scientists around the world come up with different solutions, uh, you know, or different conclusions to the same, uh, the same question. And that's why we have scientists trying to duplicate each other's work to see, is that really valid? I think that's really exciting for our students. Th thank you. <laughs> that's all the questions. Uh, Mrs. Jacobson has questions. I do. I just have a few. Thanks. Um, just again, reiterating, thank you so much for the presentation. And I know this is a huge lift for everyone in the science department and it, um, doing a great job. So thank you very much to everyone that came and has helped you with that process. I have a little bit more pragmatic questions for us. Um, the last time you guys were here, you mentioned a, that finding materials right now was a challenge. Um, I kind of looked myself a little bit. There's a little bit for middle school, a little bit for high school. I saw very little for our elementary school out there, especially even following the state's own links that they're like, oh, we have all this stuff for you and really not so much. Um, so are you finding it's getting better? Do you have a textbook that you've identified at this point? Because I know last time you hadn't. So just an update on where you're at with the actual The resource stuff. piece. Yeah. Um, so our plan right now is we're going to continue to use our current resources. We're adding Chromebooks um, to all of the high school classrooms and to all of grade seven. So we're beginning that, you know, that rollout. Um, but all of the high schools, uh, excuse me, the high school science classrooms will be outfitted with a classroom set of Chromebooks. Um, 
the Chromebooks will really be um, a tremendous help, as Dr. Kelly talked about, because we, first of all, um, you know, science is an ever-changing thing. So as soon as we, we order a textbook, something in it is no longer true. But um, the other thing is NGSS is not necessarily um, based in a textbook. So um, the, the textbooks that we're using, we're using for resources on, on facts and pieces of information. Um, and those don't change that, like chemistry is, hasn't changed much in, you know, 20 years. Uh, there are new discoveries, but I mean basic, you know, high school chemistry, the facts haven't changed a whole lot in 20 years. Um, so we're also looking at, um, we've, we've already started creating um, a list of digital resources that will support this work and you know a lot of it is open source uh, things from universities MIT things like that um, we have some subscriptions to websites that we use um, and then uh, just accessing um, you know scientific journals and articles um, that students can use um, as opposed to a textbook that's our plan right now we are continuing our search um, and we do expect to be bringing you some resources um, in the 1819 school year um, but right now um, you know rather than go ahead and bring you something that's sort of okay um, we'd rather continue the search and um, I know that there's one one publisher who is coming out with something in September that they've shown me a preview of it for high school it looks pretty amazing um, so I'm anxious to see the the full the full thing um, so that I can, you know, we can really evaluate it and see if that's a good match for us. Okay, so they won't have an actual textbook. Well, they'll have their current textbooks. They're just the current ones right. Are right now. And elementary, I assume, is the same, or middle school is the same? Right. Elementary, uh, we are not going uh, to be full implementation next year. We are, um, you know, upon approval, we really would love to dive into the, uh, to the River Lab portion and focus our attentions there. Uh, we do have one of the uh, greatest resources available to us, the river. Uh, as well as um, many resources that we also are looking at uh, online. As I mentioned before, some of the nonfiction texts are some things that we're continually looking at and purchasing. Um, and um, it's, it's repurposing the resources that we currently have in our buildings and thinking about how are we using them from a phenomenon standpoint as opposed to presenting fact standpoint. Um, so it, that, that is where we're going. And again, part of uh, our focus really is about building teacher content knowledge and, and professional development initially. Um, and as far as the market goes, there are a couple of promising um, resources that are coming online that we're, we are looking at. Um, again, we are not bringing anything forward this evening. Okay. Um, but there are some companies that are really paying attention to not just the uh, and next generation science standards, but the intent behind them. Um, and that's typically what we find. We'll find multiple companies that will put the stamp on it that don't really align with the intent behind it, but there are some companies that are paying attention to that, so we're looking forward to that. Okay, thanks so much. I just wanted an update on that. Um, a couple other questions that I had. The um, we saw other people asked about the evaluation piece, so that was one of my questions. But just piggybacking on that a little bit, your answer is, you know, how they come to an answer and more of an inquiry-based instruction model, um, having more than one answer be okay. But however, the state mastery exam is one right answer. Is it right? I mean, so it, it, it's just, it's a, they have, do you know what I'm saying? Like you're teaching them one way and we're trying to move to this new model, but yet the, there is this thing at the end that doesn't really match that. Actually, there's more than one right answer to the state assessment. On the on the state assessment. Yeah, so the state the state assessment is interesting. If if you haven't had an opportunity to look at it, I'd be happy to send you out the link so you could look through it. But um, one of the big differences between our current well the old assessment and our what will be our new assessment is that. Um, there are multiple right answers, and there are there are questions, and I you know I defer to to Dr. Kelly. Even on the AP test, there are questions that say um, choose all the right answers. So it could be, but that's still ending up with one right answer by choosing the right answers, right? I mean, 
Um, a lot, when, when the students have to um, actually do an experiment, they have to pick which variable they're going to test, and they can test more than one. Um, so there's more than one way of getting at it, and then they have to decide how they're going to test it. And this is all assessed on the test. They're, 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 they're clicking and dragging certain things into spaces. Um, so uh, the state assessment really has done a pretty good job of mirroring the way that they're asking us to um, deliver this, this curriculum. OK, great. That's good news. Um, Knowing that we are in a transition phase and some of our grades are going to be a bit of a disadvantage going into that, um, are we contemplating not using any of this for at least a bit of time in terms of any placement decisions um, as they move forward? For instance, if they don't necessarily do so well on that, it won't be a consideration into what the teacher might recommend in for high school, for middle school, for high school. Are you talking about the test? Yeah. Um, well. We, we generally don't, don't, use. don't use that um, to begin with. We don't, we don't use capped scores to determine teacher recommendations. Not to determine, but as a piece of the. We, we've, never, we've never used that, um, that kind of thing. We, tend, we do tend to use um, um, SBA information for reading level. Okay. Uh, simply because the resources that teachers are using with students, you know, in an honors class, for example, at the high school, are at a much higher reading level than um, in a college prep. You know, so so we tend to try to look at those kinds of things. Um, but science, we, you won't be. We won't be. Okay. All right. Great. And um, and just congrats on the course enrollment. I think it's all the new names that uh, made them sound so fantastic. So like the, uh, that's really exciting to hear that so many of them are. Yeah, we're Sign we're very excited about it, and um, you know I think uh, this has been a long time coming, um, and so we're we're anxious to get you know get going and and roll this out and have some fun. Great, thanks so much. That's it for me. Thanks. Other questions from board members on the science curriculum presented to us. Uh, seeing none, uh, this will be on the uh, first meeting in May uh, for adoption. Uh, in action. Um, as reported, there won't be any textbook approvals concurrent with that um, uh, for the new board members. Uh, while curriculum needs five votes to get approved, which has not generally been a problem, textbooks by an 1880s state law require six votes. Uh, and so um, uh, sometime next year, I understand by your answer, we may be asked to approve a textbook. With no further, thank you very much, not only for your presentation, but for the support you have sitting behind you. Yeah, we, we want to extend our thanks to those folks again. Um, without them, we couldn't have gotten this done. So they deserve a lot of credit. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're all uh, leaving, we'll see if there's anybody from the public who wants to come forward to make a yeah. comment on public comment on any agenda item. So any member of the public that wishes to come forward and uh, speak to the board on any agenda item that is here, please feel free to come forward at this time. I'm, I am presuming the people standing up are leaving and not coming down to the desk, so we'll move on. Um, on to uh, old business. Uh, there is no old business, new business. Uh, this is the time that we establish the date for graduation, so the recommended motion is that the Board of Education is that the Board of Education establish Wednesday, June 20th, 2018 at 6 p.m. as the date and time of graduation for Fairfield Ludlow High School and Fairfield Ward High School. Do I have a motion? Uh, Mrs. Gerber, do I have a second? Mrs. Jacobson, uh, uh, does the superintendent wish to make any comments on the... Uh, um, date? 
the only comment that I would like to make, just because I've had some questions um, from the public, is that is the earliest date that we can graduate by the way that our calendar is set. Um, we must be in school a minimum um, of 180 days. And if you remember, Fairfield Ludlow had a pipes uh, issue burst. So this uh, allows both high schools to still graduate on the same night. Um, and both both of them be at 180 days. We could have pushed it back to the last day of school, which was the Thursday, but we also heard from some families who, um, because we are graduating so late in June, there are several universities that actually do their orientations, and that's the last one uh, before they go into summer, and they had requested that if we could consider where they can still make it to their orientations, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. So we've set that for June 20th. Questions from the board? Mr. Peterson. I, ha I have no real objection to this. I just, I'm curious uh, how this may uh, conflict possibly with uh, middle school and elementary school graduations. Um, my understanding right now in middle school is they are, they are doing theirs on the 21st. I don't know if I have any middle school people to still confirm, but we were just talking about that today. Any other questions from uh, board members? I, I actually thought it was going to be on the 21st, and I'd have my wife there, and we'd celebrate our 49th wedding anniversary at a graduation. <laughs> Most of you think that wouldn't be qualify as a date night, but <laughs> Mr. Asa. I just have a question, um, and it might just be because I'm new, but just going back, is this a deviation to what is normal? I mean, I know you, you mentioned about a few families had expressed concern. Um, I'm not going to object to this, but um, I guess I, my figure is, you know, the last day of school is the 21st, and in, in past practice, if you could just let us know. We did something similar last year. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't go back 10 years. It used to. I know in theory, having it on the last day of school is ideal, um, but we are, we are late this year for students who wanting to take summer school in college and, and get to their orientations. So, I mean, I think it is the best that meets everybody's needs this year. Um, not that every year we'd want to do that. I actually would like to look at in May or June um, bringing to the board a little bit different calendar where we can have our graduation date set and we don't have to change it or look at it again in April. Um, if we had a 185 day calendar set from the beginning of the year and we set our graduation date, um, we would not have to look at that every April because as you know, we, we get the phone calls from somebody who has their aunt or somebody coming from England and they're trying to get their flights and it is hard on families, but that's something we would have to look at, we would have to discuss, but the law does allow us to do that. Okay. Because I understand those people, you know, with people coming in and yeah. whatnot, but on the flip side, when we approve the calendar, it does specifically state how that will happen with days added and everything. So one more question, setting this for June 20th, what if we do have another cancellation? Um, because it's after April, we're actually legally okay to still graduate on the 20th. It all has to do with the time of the year, and it has to do with how your calendar is set. Um, and they, they, actually, the commissioner sent us all out a reminder because everybody in the region is dealing with the same thing where, you know, we had the law so that we could all make sure we were staying within that. But that's why some districts around us are actually graduating like on the 16th or the 17th, yet everybody in this region has had between seven and I think the most days was 10 or 11. Okay, so yeah. since, since we're in April, not after April, since right. we're in April, That's there's, a, there's a, a caveat. To, okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Any other questions? This is a voting item, so we'll go out to the public for public comment on this voting item of setting the high school graduation date. Anybody wish to come forward, please come forward. State your name and address. Um, hi, I'm Emma Vanderbilt. Um, uh, uh, if you would, sit down so that <laughs> you may not realize it, but you're on TV. Hello. <laughs> Um, I'm Emma, I live on Woodcrest Road. Um, and so as far as the graduation dates, um, I'm legally required to go to on-site staff training in Litchfield, Connecticut for a camp I work at the 16th through the 24th. Um, last year that was possible with the graduation date being the 15th was my last final day. I was able to get out. 
Um, the conflict this year is um, I'm a senior at Fairfield Ludlow and we offer the senior internship programs. Um, and I'm dividing my internship into three different shadowing different health teachers and the health coordinator in the district. And for my last um, internship, I'll be at both high school and middle school level classes. Uh, and my question basically is, uh, is there any, <laughs> any sort of alternate as far as the internship program because it's creating a lot of different um, conflicts with both my internships and other internships that I'm aware of with other people working at different summer programs. Um, and it definitely conflicts with the legal requirements for maybe me to be able to um, work at that summer program later on in the year. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, for public comment, we don't normally respond to questions, but if your question is not so much the graduation date, but the internship mm -hmm. program, you might want to uh, ask the people who run that internship program. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same last name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, I spoke with your wife today. <laughs> if there's, if there's uh, any help that she can give you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wish to come forward to uh, speak on an agenda item? Uh, hearing none, uh, on to discussion of, oh yeah, sorry, uh, now that we're back from public comment, um, all in favor of the motion that the Board of Education established Wednesday, June 20th, 2018 at 6 p.m. as the date and time of graduation for high, Fairfield Ludlow High School and Fairfield Ward High School, raise your hand please, one, two, three, four, five, unanimous with seven people attending, thank you very much. Now on to item 7B, discussion of possible 2018-19 budget changes. Uh, I'll have the superintendent make a comment, I'll make a comment, and any board members may make comments as well. Um, well, as, as we've journeyed through this week, actually I'm, I'm very positive about where we are in that uh, we did make an adjustment with um, the Board of Selectmen on the $60,000 uh, pension that we could actually reduce after we got the numbers. We also were able to reduce our budget by one, that $190,000 because of the recently signed bus contract, uh, which does put our budget at 2.95%. Um, when we were in front of the Board of Finance this week, they did approve the budget 9-0, uh, which you know was we were very thankful for. Last night we were in front of the RTM uh, for questions, and there were no questions, um, not one. Which was it was worth sitting there two hours really to have no questions. So, um, so we're sitting in a very good spot. I feel like right now with the budget very positive. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I want to uh, thank. Uh, I'll say Dr. Jones, but uh, Mrs. Munsell and all of the staff, uh, as you know, during the budget cycle, uh, we'll get a question from an elected public official and they expect the answer like in the email right away. Uh, but frequently they expect the answer in time for the next meeting. And so it takes a lot of work on the part of the staff to, to make sure they get the right information, that it's accurate. So I want to thank uh, the staff uh, under Dr. Jones's leadership for responding to them so that there weren't any open questions that might cause them to then say, well, perhaps we shouldn't approve something. Um, and I think that was um, helpful. Uh, so I uh, do look forward to uh, the RTM meeting with a positive vote that I think a signal of, of uh, of no questions last night uh, gives us some assurance of, of that vote. Uh, and so at the moment, the only official budget changes that we will have to vote on in May is those two adjustments that Dr. Jones just mentioned. Uh, as far as I'm understanding from Mrs. Munsell, there isn't any other contract or known thing that will change between now and the May vote. Um, and of course, if it changes afterwards, the staff have to adjust as they do every year. Um, one other comment. Uh, some of you know that uh, there was some conversation about the Aon question as to how much we actually saved uh, at the Board of Finance. And many of you were at that meeting. And, and I've tried to, uh, for an RTM member, I summarized it in this way. Um, we wanted to confirm that it still made sense for us to switch to Partnership 2.0. Uh, and as a result of that, we asked Aon to say, you told us we probably would save three and a half million. Could you give us an update on that? 
what was unknown to us uh, uh, as a board or to the staff <laughs> is that Aon had a challenge of saying, shall we use a limited database from the current uh, Partnership 2.0 claims experience, uh, which they didn't have a lot of faith in, or should we use the only claims experience we have, but it's older, so we have to trend it forward more than just 12 months. They chose the latter. Um, um, in hindsight, I think what they said is we should have just said to the Board of Ed, neither database is good to work off of, so why don't you wait for a while and then we can give you a better answer. This March, they had enough of a database, so the real answer, real actual savings is $2.6 million, not the $5 million that they were projecting. Now, having said that, um, uh, that is still a good savings and it will continue to grow. I think the decision was still good for us. Um, and if you saw the map of the school districts and towns who switched to Partnership 2.0, it does favor Fairfield County. Uh, we have a, a little higher cost basis for our health care and sharing it with 300,000 lives throughout the state um, is helpful. Um, uh, so at the end of the day, it was a lot of discussion, but uh, two clear answers. Uh, uh, next year, uh, we won't have to talk about projections because it will be a simple math. How many lives? What's the percentage increase in the insurance premium? And there's our budget. So in the past, we used to have a lot of debate and discussion on Aon's projection methodology, and that's kind of behind us now. Any questions on the budget changes? I thank board members for getting to the various meetings. I think every time people see members of the Board of Education in the audience, that is helpful. Um, on to approval of the minutes. Um, you'll note that this is the first time where we've officially put a combined motion. In the future, if any board member wants to separate one of the minutes out because they need to make a correction, just say that. But in the future, you'll see that we'll have one motion for all minutes. And so the recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the special meeting of March 19th, 2018, and the regular meeting of March 19th, 2018. Do I have a motion? Mrs. Gerber, followed by Ms. Leeper. Any questions? Uh, no. All in favor, please raise your hand. It's, your nan it's uh, uh, six in favor, Mrs. Leeper, Ms. Leeper, uh, Mrs. Gerber, Phil Dwyer, Mrs. Jacobson, Mrs. Maxon Canelli, Mr. Peterson. Uh, any no, no no's, any abstentions? Uh, it's, it is custom for, to abstain for uh, uh, when you're absent from a meeting. So the uh, motion passes 601. Um, superintendent's report. Um, I just have a couple of things tonight. I do want to point out we have new banners behind us, and they're beautiful. Um, this is a project that our students at both high schools um, are working with the town development uh, on, a, on a making place um, around town. These are actually going to be made into posters, and they'll hang at the metro stations. You're going to see them everywhere, and so it's just a wonderful joint effort. We do have five more that will be coming uh, in due time, and one of those will actually feature the school system um, because that is an important part of our town so congratulations to all those students um, I was able to visit um, Walter Fitzgerald and a project they have going right now which is a generosity project and hope and um, the, the students have just done a phenomenal job with the project and when I was um, over there today every whenever people are visiting whether that's um, a custodian perhaps that's there and the students you know are interacting with or they have a guest in the building they've made these bracelets which are um, kind of what they consider hope bracelets and they're all hanging on the mural and then they're giving these bracelets out and the students actually made all of the beads uh, well all of the clay beads by hand they've been fired um, and then they come with these messages of hope uh, like joyful living and you know enjoy life and it's just um, it's part of their community at Walter Fitzgerald and although it's the oldest building really as far as how it looks what's going on inside that uh, school is just amazing so I just want to give them a shout out it's fantastic let me mm -hmm. so I was at some place I won't say where um, and a guy recognizes my face and says oh let me show you this bracelet was that not this bracelet but one exactly like that 
And he said, well, my wife teaches at Walter Fitzgerald. And every weekend, these get fired at her home <laughs> with her husband and herself, um, certainly going above and beyond the call of duty to, uh, to do that for students uh, so that they would support their project. So uh, I just thought I'd mention that. Please continue. Uh, that's awesome. And it's actually when she's heating her house. It's her, it goes in the fire. <laughs> Um, we did we have also just as a follow-up for the public uh, we did have you know the safety forum which was you know very well attended that night and just to assure the board and the public that the police and the school system are continuing to follow up on any of those comments that were made we've had an elementary meeting with all of the leadership team we've had middle school meeting high school meeting um, and you'll probably if you if you have students in certain areas will notice some changes on things like high school where the doors are not open as long in the morning for instance before school where they were unattended. Um, they've also reduced uh, the points of entry, especially um, at Ward where almost every door was open in the morning and now they've limited that and again that's working with the police on safety. Um, we've also were assessing the blinds around the district. A lot of the teachers said when they go into lockdown some of them have blinds that were broken and they can't shut their windows so we're doing an assessment of that. Um, we have a couple of parents who have reached out who want to do fundraising type campaign and uh, the finance committee this week discussed that that you know the blinds may be something depending on what it looks like that we could actually work with the community to help with so um, then the last thing I'll mention is we do have the search for the Sherman principal um, Eileen Roxby is retiring and um, we have done the meeting with parents and got great feedback on what the parents are looking for in their next principal we've had our meeting with the staff um, and they've provided that input we also um, issued a survey to staff parents community and then we overlay where their answers are so out of 12 traits for instance they'll pick what are the top you know six is what and kind of put them in order and the really interesting thing which is great is the parents and the staff matched exactly on their top six and almost in the same order like it was like a number one was a number two but that's really good because it means that when you're looking at the candidates it's it narrows it a little bit in what you're looking for and we feel really good about the candidate pool for Sherman so we'll keep you updated as we're going through the process any questions for our superintendent on the items that she reviewed uh, mrs. Maxson Canelli um, just one quick question uh, tying back into the budget um, with the work that's going on at Walter Fitzgerald campus um, are we, have we been able to make any steps forward with advertising it as a place for possibly other districts to or is that not part of any conversations at present I see mr. Mancusi making his way forward <laughs> good evening Rob Mancusi director of special ed um, we're currently working on a um, pamphlet for Walter Fitzgerald I know mrs. Donowitz has done some preliminary work on that We've had some discussions. Once the pamphlet is complete, I was going to go to the Fairfield County's, um, you know, our con case meeting for directors of special education and share that with them. Thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Jacobson. Sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. Yeah. Not so just, quick. Just following up with that. Um, the pamphlet meaning invitation to possibly join the school. It's the pamphlet to share what the program is and the services it provides and the the you think it would be open then where we are opening it is that the idea is to potentially open a couple of slots um, to um, Pr prior to uh, the current board um, we did approve so that we're on record as a board of education uh, to allow up to five spots <clears throat> for people outside of the district thank, so, you. thank you for answering that for me <laughs> Okay, on to committee and liaison reports. Anybody uh, have things that they want to talk about? Uh, Mr. Asa first, Mr. Peterson second. Uh, just a, uh, nothing major on Holland Hill, but they were having a meeting tonight um, that coincided with ours, so obviously no representation there. Um, but they are uh, they were working on um, receiving updated information on the demo and abatement bids, and um, just seems like they're moving along pretty well. Okay. And you didn't get any call from uh, the chairman saying you really ought to show up because we've got a real problem that he knew about? 
we may have had some communications, but nothing to that effect. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Well, I know uh, we were all at the uh, Board of Finance meeting, except for Ms. <coughs> Kelly, who was uh, live tweeting it from home. Um, uh, but for the, for the sake of the record and, and for the public at home, uh, the, uh, uh, our, our budget was approved uh, unanimously by the Board of Finance, but there are also two other items uh, that they dealt with. Uh, there was a, also a unanimous approval of the uh, Phase Three project at Sherman School. Uh, there was a far more involved back and forth conversation about the uh, Mill Hill renovation. Uh, there was concern about whether we should uh, identify it currently as a 504 school or perhaps another side, a size. Uh, that range, that discussion covered a lot of ground. Um, but uh, ultimately, the Board of Finance approved the motion with the amendment that. Uh, various sizes be uh, explored uh, and that they get a report from a building committee once it's formed. And on behalf of the Board of Education, I represented that that seemed like an appropriate thing to do. Um, I've also represented that the uh, Board of Education believes that in the long-term best interest of the town, uh, that school should be a 504, uh, but if uh, cost is a factor based on what's in the waterfall chart, um, that um, the building committee ought to come back to the Board of Ed to say, here's where we are and will you adjust? And that's an issue I think, and I think we convinced the Board of Finance to say, let's get the information and make that decision next spring. Uh, uh, any further you want to comment on that, uh, Mrs. Maxson Canelli? Uh, I think um, Mrs. Jacobson might have had a question no, 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 as well. Okay. So in policy, we had uh, started with the uh, policy regarding the use of social media uh, in the schools, and we have put that on hold as we begin. Uh, we had the preliminary round uh, with Mr. Cummings uh, regarding high school graduation requirements. So we have really had a good full hour of discussion on that uh, this past Tuesday, and look forward to really jumping in both feet. Um, our next policy meeting is on the 24th. And as of now, I see no reason we wouldn't be on schedule for having that to the full board uh, for discussion and vote um, at our two June meetings. Okay. Any questions for the policy committee or the Board of Finance Committee? Uh, Mrs. Ms. Leeper. Um, Dr. Jones talk, uh, touched on it, but for our first regular finance me uh, meeting, we talked about exploring uh, sponsorships and specifically the district would benefit from finding funds to cover the cost of the blinds so we're looking into that and um, just making sure there's no legal uh, requirements around how you do advertising and sponsorships and that sort of thing and then also we got a really extensive document about all of the ways in which the district already collaborates with the town and I knew that a lot of those things were new information for me and it was really interesting and maybe something um, other people might be interested in also. Um, I was at the organizational meeting for the Board of Finance and I'll say that it struck me that this idea of sponsorships uh, may have some legs. Um, and so if anybody has viewpoints on that question uh, as from the Board of Ed, you really ought to share them with the members of the Board of Finance, uh, w uh, with the Finance Committee uh, so that they don't come forward with some plan that that uh, doesn't reflect the board's thinking uh, since this is a brand new subject and we've never talked about it before. So feel free to do so. Mrs. Maxson Canelli. Um, and just to follow up on that, I had been in touch with uh, Ms. Leeper as the chair of the Finance Committee regarding policy because it had been on our agenda as one of our future items. And so we've struck that from there to turn it over to the Finance Committee because we don't want to be creating policy for something that then I can't imagine it not being financially feasible or, you know, something that's a positive, but we decided to put it into um, their court, and obviously, uh, Ms. Leeper and I will be in touch if it needs to come back, that it's looking to go forward and that it does have policy implications. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Gerber. Uh, well, actually, this goes back to um, the discussion about the Board of Finance meeting um, regarding the Mill Hill and the amendment made. Um, I know I asked Dr. Jones uh, the other day um, <clears throat> after the meeting, um, do we have any clarification yet as to whether, you know, because I know they were saying that the Board of Selectmen has to now reapprove 
the um, bonding resolution, and I just wasn't sure how that worked out. You know, will Mill Hill be able to be with Sherman going to the RTM this month, or do they have to wait? I, I did speak with the first selectman late today, and he was able to confirm that we're good to go to the RTM. Um, the, from the language perspective, um, it, what it really changes is his charge to the building committee. And that's what he is reviewing closely, but it's him. So we don't have to wait and go back to Board of Selectmen before we go to RTM. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. And you, you know that both building committees have been advertised to the public. Um, I also spoke with the first selectman to indicate that there is a certain amount of time to get resumes, vet them, interview them, and get them ready to move forward through all the boards, and that I had hoped that he would aggressively move those forward so that once this question of the uh, charge was worked out there wasn't um, there was they weren't going to delay the process of getting the building committee impaneled um, and uh, while they're waiting to work out this little question of the of the charge and he assured me that they would try and go down both sides of the tracks at the same time so that we would not lose time mr. Asa yeah, just following up on um, Mrs. Gerber and what you said, Dr. Jones. So did I misunderstand? I thought that I heard the attorney say that because the bonding resolution language changed with the amendment, that the Board of Selectmen actually had to vote on it again. Um, what I was told today, talking to the first selectman, is that because it's a minor change. It wasn't a major, a major change to the language, so it does not have to go back. Okay, okay. Mrs. Jacobson. Um, just a, I know that it was covered in the Board of Finance meeting about the amendment um, in that we created the alternate sizes to be included in that preliminary work with the seed funding. I was just wondering if Mr. Cullen had anticipated any additional costs due to that amendment in terms of doing some extra work on it, uh, as, or if that would just be sufficient. No, he's shaking his head no. No, oh, I didn't see you. So <laughs> through the superintendent. Didn't see Mr. you back Cullen. there, Mr. Cullen, sorry. And the superintendent is answering on his behalf that uh, the 1.5 million um, should be sufficient, especially if we let the uh, architect and engineers that we're hiring know in advance this is part of their charge. Um, it's always when you give something to an architect and engineer after they've started their work right. that, um, that they give an opportunity to say, well, this is a change and it's going to cost you more. So. Okay. No, we anticipate that we'll be able to do that within the 1.5. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other committee liaison reports from the board? If not, let me make a couple of comments. Um, I was at the CES board me meeting today, and some of you know that uh, uh, Evan Pitko is, uh, uh, is retiring, and the board, uh, by action, uh, hired, uh, offered uh, Mr. Charles Dumay, uh, who is currently with the Amity Regional School District number five in Woodbridge to be the new CES executive and he'll start on July 1. Um, uh, we have uh, two uh, liaison positions. Uh, uh, the um, administrator's contract uh, that needs to be staffed, if you will, uh, from a board member. Uh, I've asked a board member if they would take that charge on uh, and so if, if that is not possible, I'll need to come to somebody else. Um, and if there's any other changes to liaison positions that I should be made aware of, let me know so I can get somebody to uh, cover that as well. Um, and the last, AB. No, uh, that's it for the committee liaison reports. Any other committee liaison reports? If not, on to open board comment. Any other comments on to open board? Mr. Asa? I have a couple things. Um, first, um, with regards, uh, I guess this is comment, so I can't really ask a question, but maybe you can make a comment in response to my comment. Um, with regards to the Mill Hill and the amendment and the 378, 441, 504, we, we um, put forth an ed spec with 504. So obviously, with these potential scenarios coming back, I'm just throwing it out there and wondering if it's something that we need to get back on the agenda to discuss, or is it something, do we need to start working on some sort of district-wide plan to um, further justify, um, you know, what we put forth? Um, so 
just wanted to make that comment. Um, and then the second one is I'd also like to know um, if it's possible in May um, at the next at the May meeting, the regular meeting, if we could get an update, um, kind of like we did in the past, on those funds that were. Uh, reallocated to a reserve account and whatnot because looking in the budget book I see um, an appropriated amount for 1718 and an estimated expenditure for 1718 um, and there's a difference you know of that 600 something thousand dollars that's been floated but I guess I'm curious as to um, have have we or are we going now that we know our financial stance per se are we going to be spending the money that was allocated to us by the town bodies for 1718 on those line items that may have been redirected um, or reallocated to avoid any um, I guess if you want to call them cuts that were made um, in essence so I'm not sure if you need me to clarify that or, or, or if that makes sense but uh, in the past you've provided us you know some documentation I think I wasn't at the February meeting um, but I think I, I, I watched it and there was made mention that we'd be getting a document um, you know so I, I don't know if that's coming and I know you know work has to go into that but there was talk about the you know um, special ed tuition and ECS cuts and did or didn't happen so there's there's a money here and, and the word surplus has been floated um, but I'm just a little confused and would hope that we could maybe discuss and clarify that at a future meeting because um, to me the way I look at this it doesn't seem like a surplus if we haven't spent the money that was appropriated uh, you're correct in your initial statement this is open board comment it's not a chance to have a discussion on a topic that's not on the agenda so. Uh, and so you may want to follow up directly with Dr. Jones, um, uh, but yes, I'm sure at a future meeting, probably in May, um, there'll be an update on where we stand financially. The quarterly um, is due. You know, yeah. the quarterly is due at that time, okay. and so the, the, that the subject will come up naturally. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Jacobson. I'm sorry, did you say the quarterly is in May? It, it is in May? Okay, all right, great. Um, I would echo. Mr. Ace's comment, it would be great if we could possibly have a discussion on that in May and just any follow up current status of that review. I guess we will because it's in May, but the I would. Quarterly financial report yeah. will be on a May agenda and that will be a time to talk about okay, it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Leeper, open board comment. Um, and I don't know if you can comment and correct me if I'm mistaken, but <laughs> it was brought up. Um, but the Board of Finance that there was some confusion around the way in which open choice students are factored into our projections and my understanding is that we have 65 open choice students and the projections assume that we are not asking those 65 students to leave the district and some will mat matriculate out throughout the duration of the tenure projection but it's not factoring in new open choice students coming in but rather just the existing open choice students that we have in this district that was my understanding and Malone and McBroom said that they'll continue at current levels and the word levels I think was a little bit confusing at least I found it a little confusing as if it was maybe like a rate at which we were admitting open choice students and I think it's actually just those students we're not asking them to leave the district so unless I'm mistaken and anyone wants to make a correcting comment um, that's all I wanted to say yeah. um, not wanting to get into the um, we open up discussion on an item um, um, I think you're probably more or less correct but follow up with dr. Jones to clarify um, uh, a couple of things one we will need an executive session um, to have a discussion on our uh, stance relative to the para negotiations in the administrators contract negotiations um, generally those the issues we deal with come up later in the negotiations so it's not a rush but before uh, May is out I'm sure that we'll have to have some executive session um, on those two topics uh, so prepare for that on your calendars and uh, the second April meeting is our self-evaluation meeting you each received an email uh, with a tool that Cabe wants you to fill out um, please uh, fill it out and get it to them 
so that they don't have to call me and say, I've only heard from three out of nine, and then I have to harass you. Um, and actually, I won't. I'll just harass Meg to harass you. Um, so please, uh, uh, while it's fresh in your mind, please get it to them. If there are any specific topics that you think you'd want to cover, feel free to let me know or let Bob Rader know or put it down in that comment section on the evaluation so that he is better prepared to help facilitate the meeting. Any f uh, further open board comment? Uh, seeing none, back to the public. Um, any member of the public wish to come forward? Please do. Hi, my name is Sylvia Figel. Uh, Twin Brooks Lane. I think I'm meant to give my address. It's my first meeting. <laughs> Welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, and we're a new family here in Fairfield. I'm a parent of a kindergartner at Mill Hill. I was here on Tuesday. What a meeting. Um, but with a very good outcome and let's hope it all keeps going through. Um, and I have a younger one, a two-year-old as well. So we're in it with Mill Hill for a while. So that was exciting. Um, so as a new parent to elementary schools, um, living in the times we live in today, my question is to Dr. Jones. I've been to Mill Hill a few times, you know, read a story, uh, the Kane presentation, or what have you. And what struck me is that the internal doors are open to the classrooms. And so in being concerned about my child's safety and all the children, as you all are, um, and in spending time reading, like, what, you know, what is out there as a, uh, those that are not in the security community that can read about just basic safety standards and after all the shootings that have happened over the last 10 years you know what's being published for parents to read and so on and so forth and there seems to be a common theme of you know some basic things that can happen like keeping the doors closed when we were deciding to move to Fairfield, we spent a lot of time investigating towns in Westchester. That's my only point of reference, Dr. Jones. And every elementary school I was able to visit and get a tour of, there was five. Every single one had that as part of the procedure. The doors are always closed, they're locked, so that way the teachers don't have to go and close them. And I know we have the magnetic strips and it makes it easy for them and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so my question to you is, sorry after that long introduction, um, is that on your agenda of topics to discuss for school security? Is putting in place a procedure to have those doors always closed so that way that's not one extra step that the parent, the teacher has to do? And then the other question is, as we're about to reconsider the redo Mill Hill, and that's what I'm concerned about, the entrance point, there's one door, there's that nice little camera, you press the buzzer, and assuming someone's looking at my face, um, and then you enter, and that's it, and you're in. <laughs> if you're going to do harm, you're not gonna go left into that lovely little office to like check in, um, like I do, because I'm a parent and that's where I go. Um, so is there a plan in the security procedure as part of this renovation to put in like a second entrance and then to also have equipment or something to scan a driver's license or something like that to validate I am who I am and to like put in some extra barriers? So those are my two questions, if that's on your agenda for discussion. So a couple of comments. One, welcome Thank uh, you. to your first Board <laughs> of Education meeting. Um, I do say that uh, we uh, welcome public comment, but this is not an opportunity for a back and forth questioning. Yep. Uh, twice a year we have town meetings where we do have that, and we just recently had a security meeting yep. where we had that opportunity as well. Um, um, I might suggest that you visit Riverfield School. Yep. If you're wondering what's going to happen at Mill Hill, Riverfield School would be a good example about the vestibule. Um, and if you're having questions about the security, uh, uh, I think the best person to ask is the principal. And we do have a school safety unit uh, led by a lieutenant from the police department. And if you wanted to follow up directly with him, we uh, as a board generally, no, consistently do not talk about security in a public sure. setting. Sure, um, fair, fair enough. So um, I'll follow those directions. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And is there opportunity to speak with Dr. Absolutely. Jones? Do you interact with parents? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just email me and I can give you a call. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. I got an email this afternoon from a parent. So I forwarded it to Dr. Jones and before the afternoon was out, she said thank you because somebody called me back. That's how quickly um, I think Dr. Jones and the staff try to respond to parents' concerns. Uh, 
No further public comment. If not, we'll on to adjournment. Um, the recommended motion that this regular meeting of the Board of Education adjourn. Do I have a motion? Ms. Gerber, seconded by Ms. Leeper. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. It's 7-0. Thank you very much. Nice. The meeting is adjourned. Bye. <laughs>